it's it's about really having some time to think and some space to think and um, come up with what you want to do next. And I suppose initially that's hard if you've been made redundant because there's probably a lot of negative feelings around that. I would encourage someone to even take some space and get their heads clear and try and you know, put that separation maybe between what they did before they move forward. And then to start just doing some brainstorming, like just com coming up with ideas, what you want to do next. And then once you get those ideas to start to make a plan as to how you can put that in place, you know, and even just setting out some short term priorities, some short term goals and saying, OK, maybe if I look at the next three months, this is what I want to have achieved by the end of that period. And then, you know, the next six months, the next year. So to take it bit by bit, rather than thinking of this huge, big idea, if you're setting up a business, you know, to just break it down and give yourself a step by step approach to it. Hello and welcome to The Gift Show. My guest today is Myra Dawn, founder of BeProductive.ie. My career started as a scientist with a degree from Trinity in the mid 80s. And along with many of the people who graduated with me, I emigrated to England to work in the pharmaceutical industry there and um, worked in the UK, in the US, and came back to Ireland in the mid 90s and um, had moved into the training area and realized I really love training and helping other people and enabling them to do their jobs better. So since then, I've been working um, within the training environment, starting out with technical training, but then moved, broadened out into soft skills training. But my focus has always been around, I suppose, giving people skills to help them get more from their time and to do their work in the most efficient and productive way possible. So then, as I say, four years ago, I actually set up the brand BeProductive.ie because I was kind of saying, well, what, what does the market need? What can I help people with right now? And it was just becoming increasingly obvious that people were becoming more and more busy and with it more and more stressed, despite all the great tools and technology that were we have to make us productive and um, our work environments have just gotten busier and busier. So I stopped and said, OK, I'm going to try and research what's going on and what how I can help people. And I was very much focused on creating a set of skills and tips and some training modules to help people in the Irish workplace as well that kind of fit our cultures and our, our environments. So that's what I've been doing for the last few years. Um, of course, since the um, advent of everything moving online with the pandemic, it's actually my business has a global reach now. So I am training people, doing online courses and webinars and coaching sessions for people across the board. And what motivated you to go to Trinity College to study science? Well, I loved the science subjects when I was doing my leave in Zurich. So they were the subjects that I, I leaned more towards. I did biochemistry, or sorry, biology and chemistry and love them more than languages or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I chose science in Trinity. It was a general degree for the first two years. And then I focused on biochemistry for the last two years. And did you engage fully in the student activities within Trinity College during your time there? <laughs> I did, but it's interesting because when you do a science degree, certainly back then, it was pretty much nine to five. You know, your schedule was chock a block. You had labs all day and you had lectures. And, you know, so there wasn't too much sitting around the arts block thinking about life. You know, we were kind of worked hard. So, of course, we made up for it after hours, but it was it was pretty full on. There was a kind of a separation between the back of Trinity, where all the science buildings are, and then the front of Trinity, which was, I suppose, the more arty courses. Um, but yes, we got involved. We went to Trinity Balls. We did did all the various activities and they were just fantastic years. And also it allowed me to travel every summer. We used to go abroad and work as waitresses and chambermaids in various different countries, you know, so we just had fantastic experience. So you made full use of the USIT travel visas. As a Absolutely. Student, good. Fair yeah. play to you. Yeah. yeah. And what did you learn about life during your time in Trinity College? Oh, that is a big question. Um, <laughs> I suppose when I look back on it, um, I mean, I just I, I think part of probably what I learned was to have fun and have a laugh and, you know, and, and enjoy the time. Um, 
And then, as I say, those summers really stand out for me because they gave us the opportunity to go away and sample life in another country, working in a job, but then knowing that we weren't going to do that forever. So, you know, we knew we were going to come back and finish our degree, but it was a fabulous experience. Like I spent two summers working as a waitress in New York, which was just amazing, you know, and I probably would never get an experience like that again. So I really valued that. And then within the science degree itself, I suppose it was just a great bunch of people. I've always found people in the science space, very genuine, authentic people and um, made some great friends. We had some great fun and I'd still be in touch with a lot of them today. Tell me about your experience of emigrating from Ireland to the UK. John, I actually found it really, really hard. Um, you know, we kind of left because um, we needed to rather than wanted to. There really wasn't any jobs in, in the science sector here at the time. Um, so I went over, actually did a master's in King's College in London um, for a year and then moved into the pharmaceutical industry. Now, looking back, of course, it was all great experience, you know, but at the time, I do remember um, it being quite hard and you just missed home a lot and you were quite lonely. When I moved into the pharmaceutical company, I made lots of friends and Glaxo at the time um, was expanding. So they took on about 200 graduates the year I joined. So it actually became almost like a college, you know, in work. So there was lots of people my age. We had great fun. We had money for the first time. So lots of experience there as well. But I always look back at my time in Glaxo as being the most fantastic way to start your career because we were trained in the best of everything, the best of equipment, the best caliber people. It was a very professional environment. Um, and we really learned how to go about work in the right way and learned the right way to manage and organize. And it was really a great baseline for a future career. And I so often reference things that I did and learned during those eight years, and uh, they still stand to me. Whereabouts in the UK were you living and working with your time in Glaxo? So Glaxo was based in Hertfordshire. So we were about an hour north of London on the train. So kind of midway between London and Cambridge, that sort of direction. It was a very quiet, sleepy town called Ware, W-A-R-E. And really the biggest thing in the town was Glaxo and all of us mad people who had influxed, you know. So um, we did have great fun. There was a fantastic sports and social club there. We joined all the different activities, et cetera, and um, kind of worked hard and played hard as well. <laughs> And tell me from a professional from a professional perspective, what did you learn about yourself during your time with Claxo UK? Yeah, um, as I mentioned already, just you know, fantastic training. Um learned a lot about the different roles in an organization it kind of helped you figure out which area you like the most because there was loads of opportunities to move around within the organization i was very lucky i got an opportunity to go to go on a one-year secondment to glaxo in the us so i went over there for a year and that was kind of a cultural exchange as well and was trying to build the connections between the, the two sites so that was a fantastic experience and while i was there i learned robotics technology which was used for the laboratory analysis we used to do um the analysis of samples that were collected during clinical trials at the time so obviously you would have thousands of samples so automation was key to that so there were robotics that were used in the us and i was sent over to learn that technology and bring it back which i did and that was great and um, but then a few years later i was leaving to move back to ireland and i had to train people how to use the robotics and i really enjoyed that training and transfer of skills and it actually set me up then to make a career change because i had one of those light bulb moments when I was training people and thinking I really love this being able to impart skills and give people some knowledge that they're excited about and that they're you know saying that's great now I'm able to do this you know so when I came back to Ireland I then made a change into the training area. And tell me did you find a difference between the work culture in the UK and the US? Oh, the UK and the US. I thought you were going to say the UK and Ireland. Um, the UK and the US, do you know, it's interesting looking back. That was the early 90s. 
And the difference I saw then was the US culture is probably was then probably similar to what our culture is like now, where it was people were under more pressure. The, there was this time thing and um, people worked long hours trying to deliver. You know, there was lots of hard deadlines. Um, and at the time, I found that very different because the culture in Glaxo was very much about planning ahead, being proactive you know, kind of getting organized, looking at what's coming down the track, starting things in time. So there was never really a panic or a rush at the last minute. Planning was key. Um, so that that was the difference in the culture. But actually, if I think about it now, it's very similar to the way things have become across the board right now. And did you relocate back from the US to Ireland as part of a setup of Glaxo operations here in Ireland? No, actually, it was by then I had met my husband, Paul, who worked in Glaxo as well, and we both decided to come back to Ireland. So um, at the time, Glaxo was merging with Welcome and we took the opportunity. Well, he got a job back in Ireland and I took the opportunity to come back then as well. So um, we both moved back to to the Midlands, actually, and we were working in Athlone for a while. Yeah, of course, there is a very niche um pharmaceutical industry here in Ireland now, which is a big contributor to our export economy. Mm -hmm. When you move back from the US to Ireland, did you see a noticeable change in the workforce in Ireland? Was it becoming busier? Was it becoming much more deadline focused? Was there a big increase in the employment levels in Ireland compared to when you left? Oh, yes, absolutely. That was 1995. So we were just really getting into the Celtic Tiger. Um, technology was was really just taking hold. Like when I moved back, initially I wasn't working and I was trying to figure out what to do next. And a friend of mine who was in the restaurant business in Athlone um, had just gotten his first computer. And he said, do you know anything about computers? I don't even know how to plug it in. And I said, I wouldn't be much of an expert, but I went over to help him. And it turned out, of course, all the training I'd gotten in Glaxo, which I took for granted, was a much higher level than anybody had in Athlone. So actually it led me to set up a small computer training business to help people get up and, and going and um, so people were at that point buying their first computer plugging it into the wall and d- trying to dial up and get onto the internet so email was new um, so that was quite an exciting phase and I worked with a lot of businesses locally in the Midlands to help them get going and um, so I suppose when you think about it that was pre you know think of all the emails we have to deal with now and all the notifications that that was only starting at that stage yeah. So I suppose the next 10 years, then everything really, really picked up speed. Yeah, that's right. I remember the internet coming into Ireland in the mid 90s and yeah. it was very slow analog dial up yeah. uh, to get into the internet. That's and it. of course, it wasn't half as user friendly as it is today. No. Uh, and you didn't have half the applications you have today by any means. Not at all. You yeah. kind of dialed in and went and made a cup of tea. And you know, yeah. when the kettle was boiled, you were into your email, you know. Yeah, indeed. Tell me, how did you feel when you had that light bulb moment to say, the training environment is for me and I'm going to di- divest from technical training into soft skills training? Yeah, it was um, it was really exciting. And it was so different to the scientific world that I'd been in. I'd done well in it. I'd done project management and studies and all the automation and everything. But it never felt 100% me. Whereas when I started training, I just felt so comfortable um, and really, really got that kind of sense of achievement. You know, I was really getting something back from it. And I felt like I was contributing something that people were really valuing, which is a wonderful way to feel about what you do and that's only grown and grown over the years and and now particularly with what I'm doing because people you know are struggling with their time they're they're getting stressed they're getting overwhelmed so if you can help someone and you can just see them you know getting more on top of their time and taking control of their day and their life and just seeing their stress levels drop it's just really really rewarding yeah can you explain for the audience how a person who's been made redundant can develop a productive mindset to return to full-time employment or start a business of their dreams? Yes, I suppose it's it's about really having some time to think and some space to think um, and, you know, come up with what you want to do next. 
Um, and I suppose initially that's hard if you've been made redundant because there's probably a lot of negative feelings around that, although some people choose to take a package and that's great as well. But initially, I suppose I would encourage someone to even take some space and get their heads clear and try and, you know, put that separation maybe between what they did before they move forward. And then to start just doing some brainstorming, like just com- coming up with ideas, what you want to do next. And then once you get those ideas to start, I suppose, to make a plan as to how you can put that in place, you know, and even just setting out some short term priorities, some short term goals and saying, OK, Maybe if I look at the next three months, this is what I want to have achieved by the end of that period. And then, you know, the next six months, the next year. So to take it bit by bit, rather than thinking of this huge, big idea, if you're setting up a business, you know, to just break it down and give yourself a step by step approach to it. Obviously, moving back into new roles um, I suppose it can help just to try and talk to people in the industry that you're looking to get into talk to colleagues, maybe your friends network as well. And I think it's important to stay communicating with people because if, if we get too isolated, we, we kind of lose the ability to network and to interact. And then it can be hard to put yourself out there then because I think your confidence drops to a certain extent if you spend too much time on your own. So anytime I was making a change, I tried to link in, say, with the local enterprise boards and go to some events and even go and get some training, upskill yourself on social media or whatever you need to have to move into your next phase. So I suppose it's trying to keep yourself occupied, but to do it maybe in a structured way, set out a plan, give yourself some goals and targets. And then that gives you more of a motivation to get up in the morning and get something done. That's fantastic advice. And to share part of my own story there, Myra, I was made redundant from my job. And for two years, I was in a very low space. I wish I had developed a productive mindset during those two years. I'd be a lot further down the road with my current business than I currently am, to be honest, Mm. if I had done that. In terms of the busy executive who has to work 50, 60, 70 hours a week, how can they develop a productive mindset? And I like the way you use that phrase, a productive mindset, because it's something I really talk to people about, you know, being more productive is initially a mindset shift is required. So it's not about downloading an app or getting a good planner or, you know, there are tools there, but you need to make a shift in your head first and develop that mindset. And to me, it's all about the premium we put on our time. So time is our most valuable commodity. When you think about it, it's the one thing we can't order more of on Amazon or whatever. You know, we have a limited time every day, every week. And it's about making the right decisions about what we use that time on and trying to have really clear priorities and then try and minimize that where our time gets wasted and the time we spend distracted or you know where those low value um, moments are so you know for a busy executive I would be working with them saying you shouldn't be working those long hours and that really being productive is about getting done the most important things you need to do in the time you have available and that time is the time you want to commit to your role But it's really important to step away from it as well at the end of the day, because you have to refresh, you have to recharge. And if you work long hours one day, it can kind of steal your productivity from the next day because, you know, you're not going to be fresh. You're you're going to be tired. So it really is about getting a balance and, you know, everything is connected. So what you eat, what you drink, the breaks you take, the sleep you get, that all impacts your ability to focus the next day. What did you learn about yourself as an entrepreneur and professional person when you set up BeProductive.ie? Oh, what did I learn? Um, I suppose um, I I think you learn a lot in those early months and and years. Um, Looking back, I suppose I, I learned that I had an ability to keep things going, even when it looked like you weren't getting anywhere, you know, that you, you had to really have a very strong belief in what you were doing. You had to um, have kind of the energy and enthusiasm to stick at it, even when you felt you weren't doing anything. But I think looking back, what I learned as well is it's really important to kind of dip your toe in quite early on. I started um, delivering some free breakfast seminars um, in the city in, in the Bank of Ireland workspaces and 
that um, got me up and running, you know, rather than sitting at home and thinking about what you're going to do and designing training, actually testing it out, doing some free sessions, inviting people, getting them to come along, getting their feedback. So that kind of gets you up and running and helps you feel that you are doing something and that your business is beginning to come together. So um, that would be really important advice, I would I would say to anyone. And as I've said already, to network, to get out there. Even though you don't feel like networking, you don't feel like getting up at six o'clock in the morning to go to a 7.30 breakfast meeting. I, I have people constantly telling me that I'm a great networker and I'm not. I absolutely hate it, you know, so you kind of just have to get up and do it and and do the things that um, you feel will help your business. So I suppose you have to stretch yourself and go outside your comfort zone as well. So looking back, I think I did a lot of that. What would you like to see be productive.ie? in five years time <laughs> it's interesting um just before the pandemic if you'd asked me that question i would have said oh i'd love to have a a training hub in the city center you know be productive hub a space where people could come and hang out and you know be able to do some thinking and training etc then when the pandemic came i was like i'm so glad i don't have that complex business model you know so i suppose my focus is online right now um although i am moving back into in-person training but i am developing some online um, modules that people can take in their own time so that um that information is available to people and those options as well. So it isn't always dependent on, on my time for delivery. Um, so in five years time, I guess I, I'd like to think we had a, a whole suite of training avail available for people online, um, which also does include me and an interaction and people can book coaching sessions ex as well. And who knows, maybe that Be Productive Training Hub will come into place in, in a few years time when we've all gotten over the trauma of the pandemic. Of course. Looking back at your life as a person and as a professional person, what's your greatest achievement? Um, oh, that is a big question as well. Um, on a personal level, probably my daughter, who's 19 years old now, and, and she's an inspiration to me. Um, and I love her confidence and energy. Um, so that's that's been um, an achievement. And I did kind of pull back on my career, worked part time to have time with her when she was younger. So I'm very glad I did that. And um, I think um, kind of setting up on your own and, and working as a self-employed person is um, it's a huge challenge. And I'm delighted I did it because obviously it now affords me lots of flexibility um, and great motivation as well. So every when every week comes around, I can't wait to get started into my working week, which is a lovely, lovely way to feel. So I suppose they're my two greatest achievements. What interest do you have outside of your family and work? <laughs> my biggest interest, anybody who knows me would know, it's uh, the GAA. So I'm a huge fan. Um, my father was a, a GA commentator for RTE um, many years ago. So we grew up in a house that was just steeped in football and hurling. And we spent um, a lot of our time going to matches mm -hmm. with him. So we all grew up with a great love of it. Um, I was born in Dublin. So, of course, I followed the boys in blue. And um, yes, very passionate about all of that. Great stuff. How can the audience make contact with Myra Dom? So um, the website is beproductive.ie. So that's very straightforward. And then um, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn under the same handles. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Just look up Moira Dunn. And then on the other platforms, if you look for beproductive.ie, we'll pop straight up. So I do encourage people to connect. We have a huge resources area on the website. So there's lots of templates there, productivity tools and templates to help people to do some planning and thinking and then to schedule their week and um, some tips around hybrid working. So we, we blog very regularly. So there's lots of resources there. So connect in and stay in touch and, and say hello and let me know that you heard the show.